is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy, thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always strive, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. Hallelujah. Amen. We're singing, I'm for ever grateful. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You did not wait for me. Hallelujah. To draw nigh to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 You did not wait for me to draw nigh to you. But you clothed yourself in frail humanity. Oh, yes, Lord, you did not wait for me to cry out to you. But you let me hear your voice calling me. And I'm forever grateful.
worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I was wondering out in the wilderness far away.
Hallelujah. For our opening hymn tonight, we're singing hymn number 188, Redeemed. Hallelujah. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am.
let's lift our hands and begin to thank him for such great promise. I belong to the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When he called me someday, I want to be with him. Hallelujah. Tonight, we want to approach the king of all kings. Amen. And we have two prayer requests. Sister Shariah Johnson, seek healing. And Sister Antoinette McGregor needs special need and healing. And um, we are going to approach the throne of grace tonight, all of us. You know, as we near the coming of the Lord, you would recognize that things are not getting easier. And it's getting harder and harder every day. Strange things are happening. Hallelujah. And um, we want to pray that the Lord will help us to be true to him and to be faithful to him as we fight the good fight of faith, laying hold on eternal life. Amen. I want all of us to hold hands together. Hallelujah. And let us approach the throne of God by faith calling upon his wonderful name. Lord Jesus, how great thou art. How wonderful, marvelous, miraculous, magnificent, compassionate, the great God, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the King, eternally, the wonderful in wisdom, by whom all things were made, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, in him we live, in him we move, tonight we stand in your awesome presence, Lord, tonight we give you glory and honor that belongs to you. Songwriter said, if I had 10,000 tongues to praise you, I'd use all of them to lift up your wonderful name. Thank you, Jesus. So, God, we present ourselves to you that you will continue to mold us, continue, Lord, to strengthen us, continue to help us to be faithful to you. Though rough the road, though steep the climb, Yet, God, we are coming up on the rough side of the mountain. Hallelujah. One day, one day, it will be no more tomorrow. One day. Hallelujah. God, we present a service to you tonight that you will have your own way. We pray that you'll minister to us through the songs, through the musicians, through the testimonies, whatever is done here today, we pray for you. The anointing of God will continue to reminisce through this place. And every person that are here tonight who might come for many, many reasons, God, for healing, yes, sickness, for financial difficulties, for social difficulties. God, we look to you in faith, believing that you'll honor the request tonight. You will hear from heaven. You said if we call, hallelujah, you will hear from heaven. You will heal her land. And we pray, God, for this land of us, Jamaica land we love, that you will minister to those who are to be ministered to. God, I pray for our leaders, hallelujah, our security forces, that as they work hard, yes, they worked hard. I pray, God, that you will be with them. Hallelujah. Help them, God, that they will do the right thing. 
and help us, Jesus, that we we'll walk in the straight and narrow way. As we look to you in faith, believing tonight, God, we know that you hear and answer us prayer, and that's why we are calling upon you. We pray for Sister McGregor. We pray for Sherrod Johnson. Hallelujah. You know the request. You know their needs. You know their wants. And I ask the Lord God that you will minister to them. Our viewers, God, they have needs to. They might not be able to send it here tonight. But they always sometimes find a way to send it here. And therefore, God, we ask you to listen to them. Meet their need wherever they are. Hallelujah, those that are shut in. Hallelujah, reach them where they are, God. Yeah, those that are sick and we might not even know. They might have even, even in the hospital tonight. And I might even at home and not be able to reach with a prayer request tonight. But God, you sit high and look low. And we ask you to minister tonight. Let your will be done tonight, Jesus. As you speak to our heart and our mind through what is to be done. God, we thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory and all the praise. And we say thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, let's lift our hands and begin to thank him. Hallelujah for answers prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle and the world in space. Of what he was a miracle of power was not necessarily any love 
certainly no grace. But when he saved my soul, see the stars never opposed him. The world, earth, universe never opposed him. But to save my soul. But when he saved my soul, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. Pentecostal Tabernacle, whoever you are, wherever you have come from, we want to thank you for coming to worship with us this evening. I know that there was an imminent threat of rain in some areas, and it actually rained in other areas. And um, I know that for those who have to depend on public transportation, it was not very easy. But we give the Lord thanks for those who have come. Would you just reach across and shake the hands of a couple people and just welcome them to the service. If you don't know the person, welcome them in a very special way. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come. We're going to receive our offering. like to ask you to give a offering that is worthy of the Lord. Amen. Sometimes it might be helpful if we actually imagine the Lord being here in a physical way might help our response. Amen? 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, this Wednesday, there's no prayer meeting and no Bible study. So it's a free Wednesday evening. We're going to be pushing hard for the next couple of weeks, or September to remember. So um, we want to ask you to use the opportunity to get some rest. Amen? Amen, Amen everybody. Amen. Uh, the Lord is good. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many were blessed by the service this morning? Um, important thing, brethren, is for us to change, eh? That's the important thing. It would be tragic after a, a, 
service like that for us to remain the same. Amen. It would be tragic. And uh, so we need to address ourselves to the matter of transformation. Let's all stand. Bow your heads, Lord. We are privileged yet another time to be in your presence with the saints of God. We realize that we are always in your presence, but not necessarily with your people. And so, Lord, we count it a privilege every time we come and we are very grateful to you. And we are aware that before you come, there may be a morning or an evening when we come for the last time. Sometimes we are not conscious of it. And sometimes we remember that this could be our last time. Lord, we just want to do your will. As we live from day to day, we want to order our lives in a manner consistent with biblical principles. And you have instructed us in your word to give. Some of the things that we tend to emphasize have not been mentioned in your word at all. And some of them have been mentioned maybe once or twice. But the matter of giving is mentioned almost on every page. And some of us have not yet found it found it in our hearts to give from our hearts but we stress so many other things help us Lord to look deeply in our lives and to stress the things that you emphasize help us to be faithful in our finances Lord because your word your word, your word, your word, your word, not just lead us, but your word have told us to be faithful and to give liberally. We commit this offering into your hands and we give you thanks and we give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give us unto the Lord. The ushers are waiting on us. And our singers and musicians are leading us in worship. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's worship the mighty God. Hallelujah. The splendor of the King Flowed in majesty and all the earth rejoice, and all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and the very darkness tries to hide. They tremble at his voice, they tremble at his voice. How great!
Amen. Ah, my. God is great and good. Have you found him to be good? Is he good? Amen. This, this morning I, I did see Sister Carlene Reed. Carlene, are you here tonight? Not here tonight. All right. Okay. Okay. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. I just want to let you know that, well, I'll tell you what the note says. This is an interesting note. It says, Alan Campbell and Audra Campbell gave birth to a baby boy this afternoon. Amen. Amen. They gave birth. Oh, we said. It's a torturous experience for the husband. Oh, yes, I think I gave birth to. <laughs> praise God. And everyone is doing fine. So we praise the Lord. Yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God. Thank God. Church is moving on. Praise the Lord, everyone. We're going to turn to Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. We're going to read the King James uh, rendering first, and then the New Living Translation. And brethren, I hope you understand that we're being very deliberate in what we teach and preach and present because we strongly believe that the Lord is leading us in a certain direction. And um, obviously, obviously, not everyone will buy into it. We understand that. We appreciate that. And so it is in every arena of life. But we must move on. Amen? Amen. So Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, we're looking at Jesus, the great physician. And we're looking not primarily at his healing power, but his attitude to ministry, his ministry philosophy or attitude. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, that's in Matthew's house, many publicans and sinners. Now you know that that word sinners there doesn't mean just the ordinary run-of-the-mill sinner. You know it's talking about notorious sinners, sat hardcore, hardcore, that's right, sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him, and when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, 
they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. In other words, he's saying there is nothing strange about who I am sitting among. It is to these that I was sent. And if I am to call them, then I have to be within range so they can hear my voice. Let's look at how the New Living Translation deals with this passage. Same Mark chapter 2, 13 to 17. Then Jesus went out to the lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later... Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Anybody in here know? Know? You may be seated. Now, brethren, as we go through this, I would like for you to understand that there is a message in it for the church, for us who are operating today and who have the ministry of reconciliation. One of the things we need to appreciate is all persons living in Palestine during the period of Jesus' earthly ministry saw in him a new phenomenon. All the people. And we don't have time to go through how all the different groups saw him but one thing they all had in common was that they saw in him a new phenomenon. He was a unique religious leader. One of the reasons that made him unique when he was confronted with the failures and weaknesses and sins of sinners, he thought first not of condemnation, but of cure. Not of judgment, but of healing. That was his first thought. All the religious leaders who had come before him and were operating at that time, when they were confronted with the failures and weaknesses and sins of sinners, they thought first about condemnation. He thought first about cure. When the scribes and Pharisees asked him why he consorted with publicans and sinners, he replied, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners 
to repentance. There is no more fitting analogy that could be found to express the ministry attitude of Jesus than a physician. A person in good health is not the concern of a doctor. But show a doctor, a sick individual, and his or her every faculty is a rose. That attitude towards sinners was characteristic of the ministry of Jesus. Those who were outcasts, those who were hurt, those who were despised and disreputable called out his intense interest and sympathy. So should it be for the church. We are not given the ministry of condemnation. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 7, this is what we read. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. That's my favorite verse of scripture right now. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them. The scribes and Pharisees, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. So there's nobody around him when he finds the sheep, but he puts it on his shoulders and before he reaches home, he's rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner, that repenteth more than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. God, Jesus is saying, gets more joy. Heaven rejoices more when a backslider comes through the doors and hits the altar than when all of us are here. When the Jewish religious leaders faced a disreputable sinner, their instinctive reaction was to assume the role of judges. Have we been like that? We need to look at ourselves, you know, brethren. See, I am not teaching to arouse an emotional response. When the Jewish religious leaders faced a disreputable sinners, their instinctive reaction was to assume the role of judges. In their minds, they established a courtroom, announced the law and, pres and its prescribed penalties, presented the charge, and then started the trial. When faced with that disreputable sinner, the instinctive reaction of Jesus was that of a physician. The sinner is sick. 
he or she needs not so much a judge as they need a physician for healing is the one aim above all others to be sought. So when Jesus was confronted with a disreputable sinner, his instinctive reaction was that of a physician. He did not enter the courtroom. He entered the operating theater. What do we do when confronted with disreputable sinners? Are we quick to condemn? Characteristic attitude of our Lord was that of a doctor determined not to destroy but to recover. The Jewish religious leaders, they accepted that God was willing to forgive. But as far as they were concerned, the initiative was left with the sinner. It was the sinner who had to make the first move. Because it was he or she who was under condemnation. That's how the Jewish religious leaders saw it. They said, yes, God is willing to forgive. But you are the one who has to come. You have to make the first move. God is not going to make the first move. Jesus, on the contrary, sought out sinners. He took the initiative himself. He did not wait for sinners to come to him. He didn't gather in church and say, if they come, they come. He didn't have a strong church ministry. He didn't do what the majority of his healings in the building. He had a big time street ministry. He demonstrated a willingness to go where they were. He practiced a positive, outreaching, sacrificial, redemptive saviorhood. It was not the lost sheep who sought the shepherd. It was the shepherd who sought the lost sheep. That's how he found me. I didn't seek for him. He sought for me. The songwriter said, what are you seeking? We are a shepherd. You must have lost your whole flock of sheep to make you keep searching through the long night in low valleys and up mountains steep. How long will you search, weary shepherd? When will this long night be done? You must be searching for many, perhaps 100. He said, no, I'm just looking for one. That's how he found me. whole different ministry attitude. So we think that it is the sinners who must understand that they must come. But Jesus understood that some did not understand that they must come. This was the divine compassion as Jesus proclaimed and practiced it. So, for example, in John chapter 4, verses 4 to 10, we are told, and he must needs go through Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria. 
Every Jew went around, but he must needs go through. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. You understand that, brethren? So the woman came and found him there, which means that she was coming from the city when the disciples were going towards the city. And when she was going back with the gospel to share with the men, they met her again passing. But on neither of the occasions did they find anything interesting in the woman. They just saw her as a Samaritan. They just saw her as a sinner, which is what we mostly do. It's very easy for us to walk up and down Wildman Street and not even say good morning. They did not see any potential in the woman. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, well, Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it? See, right away, She's confused and disturbed. How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which I'm a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him. If you knew who I was, you would have asked me for a drink. And I would have given you living water. Something we need to understand, brethren. In the time when Jesus exercised his earthly ministry, this Samaritan woman, who had been married five times, and was now living with a man who was not her husband, would never have been addressed by a Jewish rabbi. Never. He would have felt disgraced to be seen speaking to her. His reputation would have been tarnished. But somebody came who didn't have a reputation to protect. Somebody came who didn't care what the church folk said. Somebody came came who loved her more than he loved his own reputation. We can see this in the attitude of the disciples. In verse 27, John writes, And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. The disciples said, Jesus' ministry was vastly different. His ministry was driven by a philosophy and a motivation that's outlined in Luke 19 verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek. Not just to save, he has to seek them first. He has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So, brethren, I'm saying this because, you see, we can, we can undertake ministry activities without having the right attitude. See, we can have invasions without having the right motive and attitude. 
See, we, 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 can, we can do some stuff to make us feel good. But we don't care a row of beads about the people. And that's why when we went out for that first time, I did stress that we weren't going to preach the gospel. We were just going to love people. And I really don't want us to move too far from that. See, we can be in an almighty hurry to get results so that the annual report will look good. But I am more concerned with us building a relationship with people and making them feel the love of God in us. See, that, that's where we need to go, brethren. You no, know, I, I know that, you know, every year we are concerned about how many people are getting the Holy Ghost. I, I'm really concerned about the incarnational appeal of Pentecostal tabernacle. Do people think that we love them? What would be the opinion of the sinners out there about Pentecostal Tabernacle? You know, even, even the analogy of the physician breaks down here. Even though we are talking about Jesus' ministry and calling it the great physician, it, it breaks down here and becomes inadequate. For generally speaking, it is the sick person who has to go to the doctor to be treated. But in the case of Jesus, it was not the sick that sought the physician, but the physician that sought the sick. Most times you have to go to the doctor and make an appointment. But here's a doctor seeking out patients and not charging them. So even this analogy breaks down. Because nobody has a doctor. Very few people would have a doctor that comes to you all the time. But here is a physician seeking out patients. So what the church must do. Brethren, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really unapologetic, you know. I'm, I'm not even, I don't feel bad about saying these things, you know. Because I, I am, as I have been saying recently, I'm determined to take the gospel seriously. No, no, wherever I go, I'm looking for ministry opportunities, you know. Everywhere I go, I'm looking for ministry opportunities. I'm, 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 I'm I am, I am expecting. Posing myself and saying, Lord, let something happen. I'm, I'm looking when I go to the, anywhere I go, I'm looking for ministry opportunities. You know, I'm, 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 brethren, I'm believing God that this church is going to be one where we start getting reports of, of people getting the Holy Ghost in the offices. You know, you know my, 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 my pastor, you know, my, my, my manager was not feeling well. And she told me and I said, would you like me to pray for you? Let me just pray for you now. And I prayed for her. And she was healed. And the Lord baptize her with the Holy Ghost, you know. Or she told me that she's going to come to church with me on Sunday. I'm looking for that. I'm, I'm really looking for that. I'm looking for, I'm expecting it, brethren. I'm expecting it. So, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to us like this. Because our, our physician went in search of the patients. It he, he had the goods, but his attitude was not, you know, if you, if you come to me, you're doing yourself a favor. I used to talk like that. But, but he's saying his attitude was, 
I have something that can help you. Where are you broken one? Where are you abused one? I'm, I'm coming in reach of you. I have told my disciples that they are not to go to any city of the Samaritans. I have told them that they are not to go to any Gentile. But I am going into the district of Tyre and Sidon. For there's a lady who has a daughter that's grievously vexed with the devil. And I have to go because she won't come. So Jesus, are you breaking your own rules? We, we have to deal with that another time. Jesus, this is something Jesus did. He convinced the broken, weak, hopeless, and despised sinners. He convinced them that God loved them and cared for them individually. Jesus did not see people as groups. See, the scribes and Pharisees saw publicans and sinners. But Jesus saw individuals. He saw people. He didn't come to minister to groups. He came to minister to people. And so he knew that within every group, there will be one or two or three that will respond. And so I can't keep away from the group. I have to go there. Perchance there might be one. And I look at the men that Jesus called to be his disciples. And I find Matthew there. And I wonder if we would have called Matthew to be our close companion. A man who by his very profession says, I care more for my own money than I do for the Jewish nation. I don't mind being called a traitor. You can call me anything you want. I'm making money. And Jesus says, follow me. He calls Simon the zealot. The zealots were persons who were dedicated to the violent overthrow of the Roman government. The zealots were Prepared to take up arms and fight to overthrow the Roman government. They were involved in many situations where they killed and had to be killed. And Jesus, they were, they were the terrorists. They were the Bin Ladens of the time. And Jesus said, come Simon. We wouldn't have called Simon for that position. But Jesus saw people as individuals. And he convinced them that God loved them as an individual. He didn't just see the group and say, I saw them stay. Maybe we do that, eh? We just look at certain people and say, I saw the whole of them stay. I was talking to a gentleman one day. He passed away now. He told me we were talking about the people of a certain community not very far from here. And he said, Sir B, you know what meeting should be done? I was working in insurance at the time. Me think the government should have just passed over there and spray them and just kill off the whole of them. Oh, you look at us strange, right? You wouldn't think of that. But perhaps you wouldn't mind too much if it were possible for us to just lift up everything we have here and carry it up to Upper St. Andrew. 
and leave them down there. When, when Jesus started this ministry and started to talk to these people, they must have almost jumped out of their clothes. You can imagine these disreputable sinners saying, he's talking to me. It's me I'm talking to. Me. Rabbi so and so do even tell me how they. If, if we ever just started to be friendly to some people, that alone would save them. Fright would make them come to church. Then just say, me, 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 talking to, to, to. A new day in the spiritual history of human beings had begun. New day. This doctrine was shocking to the legalists. And in the present day, it is shocking to the modern day legalists. As far as the Jewish religious leaders, and I'm coming to a close. As far as the Jewish religious leaders were concerned, judgment was the predominant function of God. The business of the law was to define sins, announce penalties, and pronounce judgment. I'm telling you that that was the philosophy. When sinners were faced with Jewish legalism, they were crushed by this emphasis. Jesus did not by any means neglect judgment, but his emphasis was on the gospel, which proclaimed the outreaching of mercy and grace for sinners. He emphasized divine mercy and grace, acting not so much as a judge, but as a physician. That's our ministry, brethren. God has given us this ministry. One, one more thing. You know, the thing, one of the things that distinguish Jesus from that of the Jewish religious leaders and, and what should distinguish us from, from other people? It was his strong belief in the savableness of sinners. He believed that the worst sinner could be saved. As far as Jesus was concerned, there was no individual outside of the scope of God's saving power. The lost sheep could be found. The lost coin could be recovered. The prodigal son could come back home. Zacchaeus could become a true son of Abraham. Mary Magdalene could become profitable. He saw the value in her even though she had seven devils in her. Before the devils were cast out, Jesus saw that the lady was valuable. He, he, he didn't pimp her. He was after her talents. He just said, I keep, there is so much worth in you. And I see it. Everybody else sees you messed up. But I see your value. I know that when all of them running away, when I'm on the cross, you will be among the few that are there. Because Mary couldn't forget. Mary couldn't forget. You couldn't keep her from serving. She couldn't forget. And there are some people in this building that can't forget. They're going to serve Jesus until they die because they can't forget when he cast the devils out of them. It, it, 
Jesus made the worst sinners believe in themselves. He convinced them that they were worthy. All of them were valuable. I want to say this. I've said it already, but I want to say this. I, I want us brethren to understand that as members of the church, we are here to do the work of the kingdom, not the work of the church. We are not here to preserve the status quo. We, we are not here to set up ourselves and prolong the life of Pentecostal tabernacle. Just to prolong it and say, oh, we have been around from 1935. The church gets in trouble whenever it thinks it is in the church business rather than the kingdom business. In the church business, people are concerned with church activities religious behavior, and preserving the status quo. In the kingdom business, people are concerned with kingdom activities, all human behavior, and everything God has made and is interested in. Kingdom people care for all people. Kingdom people see human beings, both saved and unsaved, and all their affairs are saturated with spiritual meaning and kingdom significance. There was a time when I got saved, you know, brethren, when I thought that God was really only interested in saved people, you know. I didn't understand that God operates in the lives of unsaved people. Even bringing unsaved men and women, women together as life partners. So we think it's only the saved people God is interested in. I am learning now that God loves all people. And God is operating in the lives of unsaved people. Else we wouldn't be in church today. So, so, so kingdom people, look at what is happening in the lives of all people and see kingdom significance there. Kingdom people seek first the kingdom of God and its justice. Church people often put church business above the concerns of justice, mercy, and truth. Church people think about how to get people into the church. Kingdom people think about how to get the church into the world. Church people worry that the world might change the church. You following me? Kingdom people work to see that the church change the world. Church people are running scared. We can't go there, you know, because... The world going to come into the church. Church people say, we can't afford not to go there because we have to influence what is happening over there. Kingdom people. Kingdom people think that way. Perhaps the greatest need of the church today is to be set free from itself for the kingdom of God. The church needs to be liberated from what it has become in order to be what God intended it to be. Let's stand and lift our hands and worship the Lord. I'm 
I'm going to ask the brethren to put up two scriptures for me. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 21, New Living Translation. And then 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 22. King James. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 21. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. See, this incarnation business, brethren, my wife will tell you, it has changed the way I see people and how I interact with people. I am, I am far more willing to engage now with all sorts of people because I'm looking for a way to get into their lives. There are certain, certain things I, I, I wouldn't do. You know that I, I don't mean adultery and fornication. You understand what I mean? I, I wouldn't, you know, I would just not even go to the house. But, but, but my, my, my life has just been transformed. Because I stopped evaluating them from a human point of view. And I'm seeing them as God sees them. Kingdom people. And I'm just saying God you're going to give me an opportunity. I'm going to reach in. And, you know, I, I, just, I just marvel at Paul. At Paul, Paul, Paul said, if they ask you to go to a banquet, go. And don't ask no question what they put before you to eat neither. Because they might tell you, that is a meat that was offered to idol. You know, about what you know. You don't want to know that. You just want to know if it tastes good. Just wax it off, and nobody asks them no question. Just eat the meat. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know Him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself. A gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world, not just the church. World to himself. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he did what? He did what? He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We speak for Christ. We have that ministry now. But Jesus is not here in a physical sense. 
He said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But yet he said to his disciples, ye are the light of the world. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So, so we have, we, brethren, we have not been given the ministry of condemnation. That's not our ministry. We have been given the ministry of wreck. Our ministry is to say, come back. Our ministry is not to say, you too, dirty. Our ministry is to say, come back. No matter who you are, come back. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back, man. Come back. Come back. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 22. See, Paul took it seriously. Paul took it seriously. Paul says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, here it comes again, incarnation, yet have I made myself servant unto all. Have you done that? Have I done that? Do I see myself as a servant to all men? That I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew. That I might gain the Jews. When I was among the Jews, I went to the synagogue. I observed the Sabbath. I ate only kosher meat. Not because I believe that these things can save, but I want to enter their world and see things from their point of view so that I can reach them. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, when I was among the Gentiles, I didn't try to make them operate like the Jews. See, some of us want every church to operate the same way. One of the challenges I have when I go abroad is that what I find mostly is a Jamaican church in Canada. A Jamaican church. Wherever I go, it's a Jamaican church. It's only Jamaicans that are there. And it will only be Jamaicans that are there. Because, see, people of certain races, when they do come in, and we get up and start to sing, bond them with the Holy Ghost. They're not going to stay. You know, we, we just cannibalize everything that we touch. The song doesn't say that, you know. The song says, I wish somebody's soul would catch a fire burning with the Holy Ghost. I wish their soul was burning with the Holy Ghost. But for us, it's a true word song. Burn them. So, you see, people, people, so, so.
I wish somebody's soul would catch a fire burning with the Holy Ghost. You know, I, I, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to go overseas and see a church with different complexion people. But we would have to change the way we minister. There's a church that I go to almost every year. And uh, the emphasis is, this is not a Jamaican church. So don't think you can just come and speak Patwa and everybody will understand. Don't disrespect God's people. Because everybody doesn't understand. See, see, what we want to do is to make everybody like us. And, 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 uh, and, and uh, Brother Damien, we sing the, the song, I think it says, I know how fear builds walls instead of bridges. So Paul said, when I was among the Gentiles, now I could change my diet. And I didn't have to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Paul said, I'm flexible. Paul says, if I go to the inner city, if I go to the inner city, I can sit down flat on the sidewalk. Sometimes I'm so sorry that I wasn't born in the church, but other times I'm so happy I wasn't. You know, I had some experiences before I was saved that are helping me now. To the weak became I as weak. That I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men. That I might by all means save some. Here's the problem, folks. <laughs> Paul, Paul said, I am made all things to all men. And I employ all means. And when I, when I bring all those alls together, I won't be able to save all. I'll just be able to save some. So if I don't become all things to all men and use all means, then I won't even save some. So we don't really have to wonder why our results are so paltry, you know. Because we want to be who we are. And others must just jolly well become like us. And Paul said, I wasn't without law to Christ. Paul said, I kept my bearings in God. I did not become a sinner. You don't have to be a sinner to be with sinners. Because Jesus never sinned when he was eating with those publicans and sinners. So, so here's the thing, folks. Is it going to happen to us as individuals and as a church? That because of our unwillingness to incarnate, we're going to come home empty-handed from a ripened harvest field? Do, do we really understand our ministry? 
do we understand what God has called us to? So when I sing to be like Jesus, I'm thinking of the woman taken in the act of adultery. When I sing to be like Jesus, I'm thinking about the woman at the well. When I sing to be like Jesus, I'm thinking about Mary of Magdala. When I think to be like Jesus, I'm thinking of him washing Peter's feet. It's what I'm thinking of. When I think of Jesus, I'm thinking of his prayer in the garden. Not my will, thine be done. So, brethren, that's, that's my philosophy. That's where I'm going as an individual. That's where I'm going. This, that's where I'd like for you to go with me as a church. And we have to be willing to be flexible to reach all kinds of people. Let's lift our hands and worship the Lord. See, I guess the priest and the Levite were there, they were engaged in church business, not in kingdom business. So they said, you know what, man that is half dead, I really want to minister to you. But boy, my church duties are awaiting in the temple. But the Samaritan was kingdom minded. The Samaritan said, I'm not going to go to the temple today. You are my temple business. You are my worship today. I go and help you today. And when I, I I'll, I'll call pastor and tell him that pastor was coming, you know. But I see a man half dead. So, somebody's in the hospital. He's a member of a Sunday school class. Close down the class and go and look for the man in the hospital on Sunday. If you get the news on Sunday, you don't have to have class. Go and have class at KPH. That's, that's kingdom. That's not church. That's kingdom. Let's lift our hands and worship the Lord. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out someone. Across the dark way, there, there is, is a brother, brother who someone should say, Somebody's brother. Somebody's brother. Oh, when to throw.
but to all the lifeline and save the today. Throughout the lifeline, throughout the lifeline, someone is drifting. kept on a boat you can't stay on the shore and throw out a lifeline somebody has to get into a boat and go where the sinking are you can't stay on the shore and throw out the lifeline throw out the lifeline throw concerned about getting you emotionally high. I, I want us to pray as brethren that God would help us to internalize this ministry of reconciliation and increasingly take it serious. And tomorrow when we go to our place of work, we see these people, not just as colleagues, not just as co-workers, but people who need the lifeline. And we must say to ourselves, ministry of reconciliation is given unto me. God is speaking to them through me. Be reconciled to God. So the way I talk to them, the way I show care and concern must say to them and I must see them as an individual I care for you is everything alright how is your mom you told me she was not well I prayed for her is she doing better now somebody brought me some oranges and I thought of you and just felt like giving you three. Let's lift our hands and worship. Link with two or three persons. Just link with them. Doesn't matter whether they are in the church or not. Just link with them. I want you to look the person in the eye or the persons in the eye and I want you to say to them Are you hearing me brethren I want you to look in their eyes and I want you to say to them you are a carrier of the kingdom tell them the work of the kingdom starts when the doors of the church close Tell them kingdom work goes on more outside than it does inside church. Tell them, let's pray that we'll be genuine carriers of the kingdom. And when I go to the supermarket, I'm carrying the kingdom with me.
When I go to the hospital, I'm carrying the kingdom with me. When I go on the plane, I'm carrying the kingdom with me. I'm not ordinary. I'm a kingdom carrier. Let's just spend five minutes and pray for each other. talk to God for each other. Carriers of the kingdom. Carriers of the kingdom. Ministry of the physician, not the ministry of the judge. Ministry of the physician. Ministry of the physician. Not condemnation, but cure, cure, cure. How can they be healed? How can they be made whole? Thank you, Lord. 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 Let's stand, everyone. Stand. Praise God. Let's lift your hands and feel after Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Blessed be your name. There are few precious people who are in the altar. Would we just come close to them and let's spend another 10 or 15 minutes just praying with them and believing the Lord for them. Would you do that, brethren? It's just 
share in the moment and see what our God will do. Let's, let's operate as physicians. Thank you, Lord. Singers and musicians, would you just come and help us to sing a little bit and worship God as we believe God for souls. Some children are here too, precious ones. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. you and me. Life. He 